From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. It's the leading cause of death for Americans between ages 18 and 45. So many folks suffer from pain and they look to this alternative. We're talking about fentanyl. We are going to continue to remain laser focused on the two cartels that are most responsible for trafficking this poison into our communities. This morning, we'll learn just how much of the deadly drug is making its way into Montana. Good morning and welcome to Montana this morning on this Thursday, February 1st. I'm Diane Parker in for Augusta McDonnell. We begin with some shocking statistics in the country's fight against fentanyl. Take a look at this. In 2023, authorities seized 77 million fentanyl pills and 12,000 pounds of powder, a scary amount of which made its way to our region of the United States. The Drug Enforcement Administration's Rocky Mountain Field Division, which includes Montana, Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado, seized nearly 107,000 pills in Montana and almost 24,000 in Wyoming. Include Colorado and Utah, and the total number of pills seized in the region jumps to more than 3 million. DEA agents tell us stopping drugs from getting to Colorado will also help cut down on fentanyl in Montana. What typically we end up seeing from a trafficking point of view is that you will end up having what we call uh, couriers come down from the Billings area, head into Wyoming, head into uh, the Denver area, and they will make a round trip, come down and go back. Last year, more than 112,000 people died from drug overdoses nationwide. About 70% or more than 78,000 were attributed to fentanyl. Other drugs we prefer to call medicine can save lives. And that is why this morning the Biden administration is taking a key step in a multi-year effort to lower the cost of prescription drugs. Our St. Jo Joe St. George takes a closer look at this issue and when you'll actually start seeing lower prices at the pharmacy. Well, it's an issue in small towns and in big cities, the high cost of prescription drugs. It's an issue lawmakers on both sides of the aisle say needs to be addressed. So why is reform taking so long? Well, turns out reform has already passed. It's just taking a few years to actually implement. Well, let's start with the most important thing you need to know, that the White House is not telling every pharmaceutical company what the price of every drug on the market should be. But they are negotiating with the makers of these 10 drugs what the price should be for people on Medicare starting in 2026. Maybe you recognize some of these drugs, maybe you use them. Eliquis helps prevent strokes and blood clots, for instance. Genuvia is used to treat diabetes. Thursday morning, the White House announcing that they have made their initial offer to drug companies regarding what officials believe the cost of these drugs should be starting in two years. This is expected to be a multi-month negotiation ending in August. A new website, LowerDrugCost.gov, has launched too. Biden administration officials telling Scripps News that their research shows that the U.S. pays three times more for prescription drugs than other developed nations. All of this authority stemming from the Inflation Reduction Act, which was passed by Democrats exclusively, which gave for the first time Medicare the authority to negotiate the price of drugs. I've been trying to take on, as a couple of you in the audience know, for my entire career, Big Pharma. Finally beat them. Finally, finally, finally. The law is already a big part of President Biden's re-election campaign, but there are looming questions regarding whether the savings will actually be passed on to you. Not only are pharmaceutical companies expected to counter the White House's proposal, some companies are suing to block it from taking effect, arguing the government telling private companies what to charge is unconstitutional and that it will hurt research. Many Republicans in Washington agree. Socialism doesn't work. The government can't wave a magic wand and make prices go down. Joe St. George, Scripps News, Washington. And now time to get a quick check of the weather with Miller and well, hello, February. Brand new month. And did yes. you know that it's a, a leap month or I guess you say a leap day. We have 29 days in February, so it's a leap year. OK, exciting. So one, one more day of winter. <laughs> OK, <laughs> which hasn't been like that bad. This. I know yeah. we could take it. Yeah, we'll take it. That's a great shot there of Billings, uh, courtesy of the Stockman Bank weather cam. Yesterday we hit a high of 62, five degrees shy of our record, but still 
well above our average high of 37. Our overnight low down to 34, well above that 19 we are usually waking up to about this time of the year. Gust of uh, 30 miles an hour yesterday won't feel that today, not here in our area. It's, it looks like it's kind of pushing more off to our eastern counties, uh, right against the state line there where we can have gusts today of 30 miles an hour. It's been dry out there. It was a dry wrap up to the month. We'll tell you about that here in just a bit, but let's talk about some record highs yesterday. Baker. A brand new record of 62 just blew that 47 out of the water. And there's a little asterisk there that basically lets you know that yesterday was one of the warmest Januarys you've had on record uh, days since uh, I think uh, 1999, if I'm not mistaken. And Baker, you may see another record today too. Livingston saw a new record of 62. Lewistown got in on the act with a high of 65 all records. All right, so we wrapped up uh, January in the hole uh, in terms of the moisture, the snow totals, and look at that seasonal. Since July 1st, we've had uh, uh, a hole, a deficit of uh, 16 and a half inches. Now we do have some snow in the forecast this weekend. It's just not gonna make much of a dent, but at this point we can bring any type of moisture we can get, especially for the mountains there. 35 right now at the airport, feels like 26. Winds out the southwest at about 15 miles an hour. 20s and 30s for the most part as we wake up this morning. Another gorgeous day today with highs mainly in the 50s, starting to get cooler. Much cooler this weekend with a chance of rain and snow. We will show it all coming up here in just a bit. All right, thanks a lot, Miller. Okay. New this morning, the Biden administration's response is taking shape after Sunday's deadly drone strike that killed U.S. service members in Jordan. And as CBS's Jared Hill reports, the White House is now blaming an Iran-backed group. This morning, the White House is ready to retaliate, blaming an Iran-backed umbrella group called the Islamic Resistance in Iraq for the drone strike that killed three American service members. We're not looking for a broader conflict. We're not looking for a war with Iran. We will have to do, we will do what we need to do to make sure that um, that uh, those responsible are held properly accountable. President Biden has approved a series of strikes against targets, including Iranian personnel and facilities inside Iraq and Syria. Floating in the Red Sea, this is just part of the U.S. military presence in the Middle East. U.S. officials say Wednesday they destroyed a Houthi anti-aircraft missile in Yemen, targeting American patrol aircraft. We're on call 24-7. It never stops. Along Israel's border with Lebanon, explosions as Israeli troops trade fire with Hezbollah fighters. Every minute they can shoot you. Every minute they can shoot me. While Israel's war with Hamas continues in Gaza, a number of organizations with the United Nations are warning of catastrophic consequences for the people of Gaza. If key countries, including the United States, don't resume funding the aid group, the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees, after Israel alleged some of its workers participated in the October 7th attacks. It is exactly because the work is so important and the work should not be jeopardized, that UNRWA needs to conduct, the United Nations needs to conduct a full investigation. UN officials fired most of the workers involved. Jared Hill, CBS News. During heated testimony on Capitol Hill, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg apologized to families who said their children were harmed by social media. The Senate Judiciary Committee hearing on the impact of social media on children looked at sexual exploitation online and included CEOs from several other companies. Families attended the hearing, some holding signs sharing their children's stories. Committee members say they want to reform a 1996 law that shields tech companies from being sued by users. Billings Public School officials are working hard to get a new charter school ready for an influx of migrant families set to resettle in the Magic City next month. The Multilingual Academy will take over the fourth floor of the Lincoln Center. It will serve the 400 non-English speaking students already attending SD2 schools. And with Billings becoming the state's second resettlement city this March, at least 50 more are expected to enroll. The Multilingual Academy opens next school year at first for middle school and high school age students only. The estimate right now is we're expecting at least 50 students and that could grow over the next year. The original plan was in January, now they're coming more in March. And part of that delay was because of the housing market trying to bring those families together as opposed to placing them all over town. Our goal is to help them attain the skills in English to be able to move forward with their goals. 
The current plan is to do a morning and afternoon class where students spend the other part of their day at their regular school. Meanwhile, an anti-bullying group is lobbying to speak in billing schools following news of a recent attack outside West High that landed a 15-year-old boy in the hospital. Christy Kriegs works with the international nonprofit Rachel's Challenge. Its mission is to eliminate violence in schools. Kriegs used to live in Billings and believes Rachel's Challenge could spur positive change in the district. We deeply connect young people with each other with healthy adults in their lives and their schools and their communities and their families, and maybe most importantly, with their future possible selves. While not involved with Rachel's challenge at this time, school leaders say they are proud of the progress they're making at West High. According to SD2's Executive Director of Secondary Education, the number of violent acts at West High has been cut in half when compared to this time last school year. Montana's Public Service Commission has questions about Northwestern Energy's handling of last month's record statewide cold snap. The five-member commission will now conduct a study looking into decisions made by the utility giant that sent bills skyrocketing. Northwestern says customers paid more because about half of the energy used that week came from out of state. The PSC will look at how Montana power plants performed during that six-day stretch, noting coal strip was down a unit for several days that week. Northwestern did not comment on the study. Now to a freak accident with a happy ending as a horse falls into a sinkhole just outside Bozeman. MTN's Kristen Merkel has details on a one-of-a-kind rescue mission. The McDowells have lived on this property for 20 years and on Tuesday night this horse pin looked a lot different when one of their horses fell through the ground and needed to be remarkably rescued. It's pretty really unbelievable that the horse came out of this without any major injuries. Randy McDowell went out to feed his horses Tuesday night when he noticed one was missing. What he saw next was shocking. Stumbled across a, a hole in the ground that had some steam coming out of it and by that time it was getting pretty dark so I went and got a flashlight and I could see the horse in the hole. McDowell called 911 for help getting his horse Ziggy out of this hole that he says was around 15 feet deep. It was a complete shock. I mean that area it's in the horse paddock. I drive my tractor across that area all the time and would have never known that there was a was a hole underground. Central Valley and Bozeman Fire, Best Rate Towing, DC Excavation, Hardaway Veterinary Hospital and 360 Pet Medical came to assist in rescuing Ziggy. DC Excavation's Donnie Freeburn finally got the horse out after hours of digging. That's what we did. We basically dug a hole next to the one and then um, excavated the wall in between and allowed the horse to come out of the hole that he was trapped in. Best Rate Towing's Paul Johnson says emotions ran high as Ziggy was being rescued and they couldn't have asked for a better outcome. When you're in a life and death situation, whether it's you know a, a horse or a person or, or whatever, um, it feels really good to have that outcome. McDowell says Ziggy's recovery is underway. He's at the vet right now, but doing okay, I think. In Bozeman, Kristen Merkel, MTN News.